little over two weeks for since Will's last outing if he started that third game on Thursday or Friday. Is that any level of concern? Do you think about trying to get him any innings before that or what's kind of the thought process? No, I think it's a benefit to Will because he had three starts in eight days. I think it was eight or nine days. Um, that's a lot. Um, and while Will didn't go to 100 pitches in any of those outings, uh, you know, he, he was asked to do a lot in big situations, um, adverse temperatures and things like that. So to get some breathing room, I think, is a benefit. And it's not like he's a younger guy that um, hasn't had a lot of repetitions under his belt. He's got that married magic going on, you know. So he's been around the block or two. Any concern that anyone would have, I personally didn't have it, I think would be erased at how he threw the ball against some hitters the other day. We decided, you know, under Coach Anderson's direction to, you know, put him on the mound and get him up and down a few times. And um, he had a little snap to him. I mean, it was coming out really good out of the hand. Um, but also, I think Will has evolved into a guy that knows who he is and how good he can be. And he's got some confidence to him. Um, and then your first question, sorry. Just y'all's ability not to have to use Hunley and Red. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Guys. Get going on some tangents here. Um, I, I think that matters a lot. I mean, you, you can't deny. It doesn't mean a kid isn't in this tournament or hasn't before, can, can't overcome being used a lot. I remember when Coastal won, they leaned on a guy big time while they were here. Um, so you can do that, but I think the longer you can put it off, the better that guy's going to be able to handle that extra workload. And um, I remember there was, you know, a couple crazy weeks there for Sean and some other guys where they really got used a lot, but we never took it to the extreme. And then down the home stretch, since May 1st ro has rolled around, we've really had good balance with all those guys. All right. We'll go to Ben next and then John and then Teresa. Yeah, Tony, I wanted to ask you about kind of the size of TD Ameritrade. That's, that's been a big conversation. I believe you all led the SEC in lowest ERA this season uh, and doing so in a um, hitter friendly ballpark. A, just how impressive is that? And then B, I mean, how, how much of an advantage is it going to be for Chad and, and those guys who really pound the zone to be able to get into a big ballpark? Yeah, no, it does play bigger here. There's there's a lot more foul ground. That's that's one thing that I, I think plays into it a little bit. And then if you catch it on the right day, it, it could play a little more offensive. But overall, it's going to favor the pitchers. I think our park is, uh, like a lot of parks throughout the country, based on weather, it, it could go one way or the other. And th the most recent attention has come from, you know, first of all, when you got guys like Dylan Cruz and Jordan Beck hitting, th there's going to be a ball that leaves the park. But there were certain days, and same thing with Wright State's lineup, so that's played into a little bit of it. But there's also been a, a several games there where it's three to one, four to three, where because of the environment, uh, the ball's not carrying as much. So uh, I think here it's a little bit more balanced as, as opposed to back and forth. And uh, I, I do think it'll favor our pitchers, but I really think if there's any advantage with this ballpark, it's that Hoover is, is kind of a modified version of this. It's a huge neutral crowd. Uh, it's media attention. It's police escorts. It's heavy competition. Um, it's more foul ground. It's a park that plays bigger. Since they've moved the fences in, it's not quite as big. Uh, and then again, there are those blips on the radar screen where it can turn offensive a little bit. So uh, it might be one reason why some SEC teams in the past have had success. I, I think there's a lot of things there, including the way the park plays that uh, make it a little bit of a precursor or an advantage going into this tournament. You've mentioned it already, and that is this is a different, really different schedule. What's the best way to take a team that's so used to routine and help them manage these spaces between games, uh, which could be over a, a good stretch? Well, it, you know, I had to answer like 15 questions about the daddy hat today. <laughs> and, um, you know, we always are preaching hydration, and today we're record temperatures around here. Um, but th these guys, I mentioned the hat because these guys have kind of taken over the locker room, and we don't have to go in there, and we don't have to dictate things to them. We make recommendations, uh, but they've kind of proven that they've got their own deal going on, and they, they're good at making decisions. So 
all it really does is it gives you a bigger window of time where you need to make your own decisions. And uh, I think these guys, part of it is because of age, um, you know, whether it be COVID or, you know, a lot of guys we've had with us for a while. Uh, but part of it is just guys that more than anything, they just want to win. They don't necessarily need credit. They, they don't want this or that. Um, they don't want to win, but also want to do, you know, other things that maybe they're not supposed to be doing. And, and those decisions have been strong all year long. So that to me is not really an issue. And then their routines, um, kind of like I was talking with Jordan, it's hard to list them because they're, they're little tiny things. But I think our guys' routines have been more about when they come to the park, um, they're going to take this seriously, or this is the part where they're going to be loose, or they're going to, you know, talk about this at the end or the beginning. We're going to have our meetings that we always do. And so th this schedule, even though it is more spaced out, still allows for that. We had a workout today. We'll have one tomorrow. Um, and we'll have our close to our regular pregame on Sunday. Um, so all in all, I think it, it balances out okay. Tony, on the other side of the bracket is Vanderbilt, uh, obviously something you wouldn't have to worry about unless you advance or keep advancing, but how good is it to have, uh, you know, two of the three SEC teams coming from Tennessee 200 miles apart with all the history and rivalry that's between these teams? I think it's really cool for the state. And um, because of the population boom in Nashville, the baseball in Tennessee is getting better. But there's also other reasons why some of the coaching, some of the facilities that are being built. Um, and then now this, I mean, to me, this should be another spark for yet another flame uh, that the communities that we're all surrounded by and bleeding all the way down, you know, into West Tennessee, too, and closer to Memphis. It, it should spark even another age group or maybe another wave of improvement in, in the baseball in our state. And uh, it should create a stronger following too. People should realize that they don't have to drive to Atlanta or to St. Louis or other cities that might be closer to see big league baseball players. They can see them for a cheaper ticket in a closer seat, uh, relatively close to where they live. But I've mentioned it a couple of times on media, being a guy that I was fortunate enough to work in the state of Texas, where they have so much pride and baseball along with other athletics are so huge down there. Um, California, Florida is in our, in the sec. There's only one state with two teams here this year. So it's something I think should be celebrated. All right, next we'll go to Trey and then Rick and then Tim. Hey, Tony, two questions. Uh, how, how is the team, man? I know you guys haven't been there long, but how do you think they've managed everything so far from, you know, doing intro videos and, you know, media appearances, stuff like that out in Omaha? Um, do you compare it to anything that you've gone through? I know the SEC tournament was a little different. Um, and then second, you know, what do you think of, you know, your lineup when it comes to hitting against Virginia and, and being able to, you know, play the field, whatnot, kind of going off what Ben said, play the field a little bit, especially since it's a lot harder to go long. Right, right. Well, you know, I kind of mentioned this to Rick when we were getting on the bus. You, you talk about winning on Sunday, and, and you're going to celebrate that win. You know, you, you stay on the field for a while, and the guys stay at the facility for a long time Sunday evening. Um, you do interviews, and you, you answer text messages and things like that. And then next thing you know, we have two lifts, three practices before we get on a plane Wednesday afternoon. That, that's a lot of stuff crammed into one small time, you know, packing up and, and all these different things. So uh, probably not until right now, um, you know, our guys are probably out of their practice stuff and, and the dress rehearsal stuff. Probably not until this moment right now, have they been able to kind of catch their breath. So I, I think they've been good about the grind part so far. Um, now it's kind of up to them to relax and you can come here and you can play hard and you can also enjoy the experience, especially now because they've spaced it out so much more. And, and again, I think that comes down to decision making or our guys have, have done well with that. And if anything, when they do get their opportunities to get in front of the camera, um, I don't think anything, anybody will do anything wrong. Um, but we definitely got some guys that like to ham it up a little bit. So I think they'll enjoy it and they'll give you know, ESPN or you guys or other people stuff to talk about. Um, as far as the park goes with our hitting, um, we, we've been in different environments. And like I said, our, our park, there's been days where you just know it's going to be a low scoring game. Um, and there's been other type of environments we've been in. And 
we've had games where we win ugly because we just pitched and played defense. Uh, you've seen Coach Chilander move a lot of guys, and we have very balanced stolen base numbers and sacrifice hit numbers. Um, so I, I think the most fun thing for the fans to watch is, again, watch a couple of these guys like Jordan hit it as far as they can. Um, but that's not how it always works out. And I think the more diversified your portfolio is an offense, the higher percentage of chance you're going to win. And uh, we're playing in a big ball, ballpark against a lefty who I bet his teammates will argue is the best left-handed pitcher in the country uh, in a program that's very storied and very well-versed in, in Omaha. So I can't tell you exactly what the script is going to look like, but I can tell you the script calls for you better compete your butt off and scratch and claw and find any way to score, uh, you know, however many runs it takes to win the ball game. Tony Teresa asked some of, of what I wanted to ask regarding the two teams from Tennessee. But yesterday before leaving Nashville, Coach Corbin was asked about Tennessee and what you guys have done. And, and he said, you know, after that series back in April, he looked to his staff and he said, that's an Omaha team. So I wanted to ask you about that and the mutual respect for these two Tennessee teams. And then how also, second question, how fun was the deal with uh, Peyton the other day? Uh, that deal was zero fun for me. I was, uh, I like hanging out with Peyton. That's really fun because he, he has a knack for making you feel like you're the superstar. Uh, he's just a down to earth guy uh, and is really fun to hang out with. Um, but you first bring in the zoom deal and I've yet to really, I, I wish, you know, we could do this in person with you guys. Cause you can read the room a little better. We can joke with each other. Um, so zoom is still not my favorite after all this time. And then you throw in the fact you're supposed to do an acting thing with a guy who's probably been in 50 to hundred commercials. He's hosted Saturday night live for gosh sakes. And I got no idea what I'm doing. And I know anything that Peyton's in is going to get attention. So while I'm doing lines or doing whatever's asked, I mean, the outtakes would have been really good. Um, but, but anyway, all I'm thinking is how crushed am I going to get by people for how bad an actor I am? But, uh, I'm glad it's over with, and uh, I'm glad to take part in anything with him and, and to promote ball fans, you know, coming here for sure. But uh, no, I, I, I like the on the, I'm more comfortable in the competing thing. And I really, you know, it's crazy to say, enjoy the competitiveness of that Vanderbilt series. Uh, so the fact that coach Corbin had that to say about our club means a lot because he knows what it looks like. Um, he and a few of the other coaches have been here multiple, multiple times and they know what it looks like. So um, I wish he would have came over and said that to me on Sunday. I might have been in a better mood because we, we did lose that that series. Uh, but, you know, I think it was something that prepared us for things deeper down the road. And it certainly, in a roundabout way, improved our team. Well, what it's worth your acting was, was first class. I, I appreciate you saying that. Although I know it's <laughs> one Italian picking up another there. So... <laughs> All right, Tim, you're next. All right, Tony, this uh, this Virginia team kind of flipped a switch back in April. They were they had a losing record going into April. Um, what do you see in this team? What do they do well? Why, why are they here in the World Series? What makes them special? Sure. Well, I think like our club, they got some personality to them. I mean, obviously, their closers interview took the, you know, Twitterverse or whatever goes on out there by the storm by storm. Um, he, he's comfortable in his own skin and had some, some great comedy in his interview. Um, you know, Abbott is the lefty that I mentioned we'll see on Sunday has kind of led the way. Um, but I, I think it, it's kind of on based off that experience. Um, you know, their coaching staff has been, you know, together for quite some time. They know how to navigate their way through tough times of the season and then also how to build up their team um, you, you know, towards playing your best in May. That's what we all want, and it's what we say. But, you know, if we could sell that and, and do it every year, you'd make it uh, more than a million bucks. So it, it's, it's a challenge to do that. But they, they found a way to play their best ball at the end. And I think like our team, they've got a balanced attack. You know, they do have a couple guys that can drive the ball to the ballpark consistently. Uh, but it's an offense that finds a few different ways to score. And they do it, again, behind that, that pitching staff that I think has kind of been a big catalyst for them as well. All right. Next, we'll go to Gentry Estes and then Wes Rucker. Yeah, Tony, um, looking back at the program's progression during your time there and now reaching Omaha, what, what do you look back on now and say, we couldn't have done it without this? 
And would that answer be any different from what you might have expected on the front end when you first took the job? You know, I think it would be. You ultimately uh, think about recruiting and players. And, and trust me, hopefully our players can see it in my eyes and, and um, know the gratitude I have for what they've done. And that includes the ones that are no longer a part of the program for whatever reason. It's been a, a great group of individuals uh, that have helped us, you know, in uniform. I mean, obviously, BFLs have helped us too, but the guys that have played for us. But I don't know that that's been the number one thing for us. I, I think it's the people that uh, work around our players. And some of them, like Woody, our trainer, and Megan, our academic coordinator, we inherited those folks. And then the rest of the deal was kind of a blank slate, and it was a lot. I mean, we were trying to recruit in the middle of the summer and play catch up in recruiting while hiring people. And when I say we, I'm talking about Frank, who's our pitching coach, but also was the guy that we hired right away because I needed somebody that was smarter and more experienced than I at working through some of the head coaching responsibilities and other big decisions that can shift the program one way or the other. So it started with him and it was complemented by some of the folks we inherited but it went all the way to October where Quentin Eberhardt was our final hire as our strength coach. And we went the slowest on that one, um, you know, to be the surest about what we wanted to do, because that's a huge culture impact deal that goes on in the weight room. And uh, I'd love to point out one or more of those guys that get credit, but Josh and Ross on the bases and, and Richard Jackson and, and a few other guys that we have just around our kids, I think have made those recruits or those kids better. And uh, it, it's kind of become our niche. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a people, I hate to try and recruit you, but it's a people program. Uh, as the facility gets better, maybe our tradition builds. If we can continue to have success, those will be things or flags we can fly high. But right now, I think the flag that we fly highest uh, and is most crucial is just the people thing, the relationship deal. Yeah, Tony, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago that that y'all were, were talking about, you know, Pavoloni and he might not be able to play every day because he'd been banged up with that hand. And when he came back, he had to monitor it. But I guess, lo and behold, he's kind of been there every day for the most part. And he, he's been hitting better than he was, you know, before the injury. Just how is he health wise and how important is it what he's been able to do despite being a little dinged up? You know, I think he's in good shape. And we talked earlier, I should have threw this out uh, prior to your question. We talked earlier about we haven't really had to wear out Hunley, Wall, Sewell, you know, all these guys. Um, you know, other guys are in the bullpen fresh too. But your catcher can really wear down this time of year. And because of having Jackson Greer to complement Pav, not only were we able to spell Pav at times throughout the year, but we were able to win games when Pav couldn't play at all. And now as we sit here in the great state of Nebraska, where you'd love to be this time of year, Pav is, I don't want to say well rested because we've done a lot the last few weeks, but he's not in the same spot. Maybe some of the other catchers that are here that have caught all year long because he kind of had that break, which it was no vacation to him. He wanted to play, but it was a break where he had relief from, from being out there and, and wearing himself down. I also wanted to ask you about, you know, Sean Hunley. I know he's named All-American again by somebody today. It just seems like for a guy who doesn't throw like 97, 98, gets a lot of swings and misses, works up high in the zone. Is he one of those really high spin rate guys, or how is he able to, to do what he does? Well, I think part of it starts with who he is. I mean, I know you said, you know, that's kind of part of your question, but I'm going to pull a part of that and say it's who he is. I mean, uh, comes from a great family, great kid, uh, cares about his teammates more than he cares about himself, which is why he's one of our biggest leaders. Uh, he's got a work ethic that isn't a, I'm in your face, I'm going to sweat and, you know, you know, yell stuff in the weight room, but it's, it's a little more strategic. And he's going to find a way to have success because he does not like it when he does not have success. And that's where you've seen kind of a consistent improvement as a pitcher during his time. And he's been able to handle bigger and bigger situations as time progresses, you know, in his career here. Uh, and then there's a great relationship with Frank, too. Part of that is he's right up Frank's alley. I mean, Frank would love to coach a guy like Crochet, left-handed, throwing 100, built like Gronkowski. Um, but the first thing on the list of priorities for Frank is to locate. 
And I think Sean locates really well. And you see guys, not just on our team, but in college baseball, regardless of their stuff, you know, if, if they're locating their pitches or they work ahead, which are old, you know, boring things to say, but they've been around forever because they work and they will continue to work. So um, it's hard to give one answer with Sean, but he's, he's a special, unique kid and he deserves any award he gets personally. But I know, you know, he's not too caught up in that stuff. He, he really is dead set on seeing this team do as well as it can. All right, guys, we've got time for a few more. We'll go to back to Ben and then we'll go to Zach and then we'll, we'll take a couple more for that. Yeah, Tony, you were talking earlier about having to scratch and fall this time of year and every team you're going to play at this time of year is going to be a really good team, great team. Just how comforting is it to know that you don't have to worry about your guys uh, scratching and, and falling, that, that they're going to play hard? And I would imagine that you feel like the, the moment's not going to be too big for them. Just how comforting is that going into the week? Yeah, I think you know what you're getting. And uh, it, it's frustrating because I've been there before and I've, I've been a part of coaching staffs where uh, whether it's the starting pitcher or the way your team plays um, and you don't know what you're going to get, it's unsettling. So now instead of the, the, the normal nerves or um, fear of, you know, whatever it might be or just amped up adrenaline, all the normal things uh, are – compounded by the fact you're not really sure what's going to happen or what you're going to get out of your group. And, um, you know, these guys have put together, like I said, they've kind of put together their own formula that works. And each day we have a particular guy starting on the mound. We know to some extent what he's going to do. We know what our bullpen is going to do for us. We know how the guys are going to behave in the dugout, how our pregame preparation is going to be. And then ultimately to your point, you know, the guys will play hard and they'll play for each other and they're probably going to have some fun while they'll do it. And we'll see where it leaves us. And uh, because they have some skill and because they have a ton of determination, it, it's left us in the win column a good amount of times, uh, which, which I've been the benefactor of being around. Tony, kind of keeping things super serious. Uh, you've had about 30 or so games here to kind of learn these guys while they're on the road. Is there a group or a pairing that kind of keeps things entertaining when they're kind of rooming together? Or is there also kind of a pairing where you just, you would not want to be paired up with a guy and, and rooming with a guy, a certain guy that kind of sticks out who, um, you know, you just wouldn't mess with on the road there. Right. No, it's interesting. I mean, Chad Dallas is the easy answer. I mean, the guy's goofy as all hell. And, uh, you know, he, he leads the charge when he's pitching in the dugout away from the field uh, locker room and uh, he, he's a special kid from a special family and um, the guys kind of rally around him in all sorts. Another one that's just been interesting is, you know, with the kids moving out of the dorms, Will Heflin has taken in Blade Tidwell and uh, it, it's just been great to kind of see that, that friendship and there's a little bit of yin and yang there. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty cool deal. And then you, I mean, it could go up and down the roster, but a guy like Cortland Lawson who lives with, with Fergie and Liam and Pav guys who are the concrete glue to the middle of our field. Um, you know, Cortland hasn't had as many reps, although he's done well with his, he's been one of those guys that's kind of found his personality in the dugout and on the bus and things like that. And it's just one example of several guys that have found their little niche. And uh, you know, I had to go do a thing at the stadium a few minutes ago and, I take note, all right, it's these six guys. You kind of know what kind of behavior you're going to get. And if it was three different guys, you'd kind of know where the conversation's going to go. Uh, but the bottom line is it's, it's a fun group that's got personality to them. All right, we'll do two more guys. We'll go to John, and then we'll finish up with Jordan. You've been here and been a part of this before, but how different are the demands as a head coach getting a team ready for the College World Series just in the preparation and getting to Omaha, as well as all the things that you have to address that don't have a thing to do about getting between the lines? I'd say the biggest demand, John, is walking around this uh, condo that they gave me for a hotel room. I, they must have thought I was uh, – Peyton Manning himself or somebody else like you see my nice artwork I got right here hopefully that impresses you um, but it's it's been pretty cool to to come and get all the attention that everybody's gotten they, they've really done this thing up uh, and each year it gets bigger and better uh, so they take care of you and while you have to stay busy fulfilling some duties they really make it easy whether it's the accommodations I mean we're in a great hotel 
the meals, people guiding you in the right direction and how friendly everybody is. Um, so it, it's really just kind of like, you know, being at home. Normally when you're on the road, you actually get a little more breathing room and downtime. Uh, that downtime has been removed so far here, but it's all kind of run smoothly. It's, it's almost kind of like you got the deal on autopilot. So, you know, thus far it's been enjoyable, um, but obviously the most enjoyable things would be wins. Uh, hey, Tony, yesterday before you boarded the buses, you kind of mentioned just the guys soaking in the moment. And I know that you're not just there to get to Omaha to see Omaha. You want to go there and, and be there for a long period of time. But for those players who, of course, haven't been there, what's it like just watching them see the ballpark, watching them go through the media that you all have done today and kind of get to to see some of the benefits of the hard work that they've done this season? Yeah, I've caught myself a few times. Uh, it's interesting. They flipped the switch. And when we've done some training stuff or, or meeting, um, you, you can see there's a sense of focus to the guys. But outside of that, it's not like, uh, you know, holy cow, it's the first time they've been in the big city or anything like that type of deal. But you see some smiles and some vibes kind of coming off them that uh, make you for a moment feel like uh, you're one of them, you know, uh, 18, 19 year old bright eyed kid that's experiencing something really special that they've dreamt about. Um, so you can either, like I said, at times feel it, see it or both. Uh, but I, I think they're, they're truly enjoying the fact that they've earned the right here and uh, to, to be here and are, are doing more than just soaking it in. They're making sure they remember it and, and they enjoy it. All right. Thanks coach. Appreciate your time. And I'll just remind all you guys that, uh, I'll send out the link tonight for tomorrow's official, like pre NCAA presser with coach after practice. Tomorrow, that'll be at the stadium, but uh, th there'll be all, all kinds of media on there. So I don't know how many they'll be able to get to questions from you guys. So that's what I want to do today for sure. But um, that'll be only, I think it's more like 20 minutes long. So, but you guys are all more than welcome to jump on that if you want to. I'll send you the link tonight. Hey, don't we get a player tomorrow, Sean? Yeah, it'll probably be Evan Russell. It's probably who I'll do. It's one player I have to pick. So I'll probably go, unless you guys have a suggestion of someone else you'd rather have. I don't know. Evan works for me. Was fine. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, it'll be Evan Russell then. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Right. Thanks, Thanks John. John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.